Today's episode of Profiles in Risk is sponsored by SaveLaney.com. Our friend Alexander is a claims adjuster, and he uses a service dog for his autism and a couple of, of other conditions. His service dog, Laney, ha has been diagnosed with, with a very, very curable cancer, and we are helping raise funds to save Laney. Learn more at SaveLaney.com. Thank you. The question I have for you, what if your pet was more than a pet? What if your pet was also a key part of the family, which they are? What if they were also a key part of your ability to function successfully at work and at life? That is what a service animal is. And it's not an easy process to replace Lainey. If the treatment didn't go well, it's not only the financial cost of replacing her, this is an incredibly emotional, difficult situation for any pet owner. And Lainey, as a service animal, is so much more than a pet. Hello and welcome to Profiles in Risk. This is your host, Tony Canyas, and today I am uh, pitching the second of a double hitter. Uh, and uh, today my, my guest is Jeff Hurst, insurance broker, InsureTech co-founder, and trainer and coach, and uh, also, if I'm not mistaken, on the board of InsureTech Utah. Uh, yes, board, uh, member of the board of directors of Insurtech Utah. Uh, uh, Jeff, thank you for joining me today. How's it going? Great, great, Tony. Uh, I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me here today. My, my pleasure. So, so basically, for, for the listeners, uh, I took, so I gave up my apartment in, in Atlanta, Georgia on April 15 and uh, put everything in storage and spent 55 days on the road going conference after conference after conference. One of those conferences was in Phoenix, and uh, at that conference, I happened to see my friend Wes Wesley Anderson, who was uh, there, and, and him and one of his other people at, at Agency VA mentioned InsureTech Utah. And I had never been to, to Utah at all. So I, so I looked at the dates, and it kind of worked, so I made a weekend out of it. Uh, so, so I landed in Utah on Saturday, did a lot of touring, to touristing around Salt Lake, beautiful city, just loved it. The only, the only thing is I didn't get to ski. And then at InsureTech Utah, uh, I met Jeff. And, and so if I'm not mistaken, it was kind of at the door. So, so basically, I was, I was kind of at the door of the event, and the people kept coming in. I kept saying hi. Uh, and, and Jeff caught my, my attention. This, and this event had really good attendance for, for like a small regional event. Uh, and and what, what caught my, my, my eye with, with Jeff is he mentioned this concept of soft risk. And I'm like, I've never heard of soft risk, right? And, and that, oh, that yeah. kind of engaged me to, 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 uh, to say, we should record a podcast about this and about your career in general. So anyway, Jeff, thank you so much for, for coming. So, so tell me more, tell me more. What, what is this concept of soft risk and, and, and how has it played through your career as a broker and every other thing that you do within the insurance and insure tech world. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And it was great to meet you at that venue and at that great event, InsureTech Utah. Thanks for supporting it. And uh, we're excited for greater things to happen with InsureTech Utah. And uh, it was fun to see you with your iconic uh, top hat and red coat and glasses. And so there you go. There it is. Thanks for supporting that. You can't miss it. I, I love that you do that. It's just very distinguishing. It's super cool. Thank you. Anyway, so just I, maybe I should give you a little bit of my background that that might explain and lead into it a little bit better. So I've been um, a professional risk advisor for 24 years, and I work with um, architects and engineers and educational institutions. And during this time period, I've been working with insurance care partners who really focus on helping us brokers know exactly what we need to do to tell these insureds to help manage the risks that they don't want to face anyway. So it's a win-win situation. So I've been consulting with my firms for years. And um, along the way, um, just to help myself, I got involved with personal empowerment, development, improving my professionalism, everything I do to try to be a better broker and also be a better InsureTech founder. And then all of a sudden, one day I was having this conversation with a client and I started to sprinkle in some of this stuff and talk about some of the softer side of their business and how that can affect some of the more traditional risks that we deal with through insurance. And they called me back and they said, Jeff, we need more of that. 
And I thought, okay, well, let's talk. And they really couldn't quite put their finger on it because there wasn't a term for it. They said, it's the professionalism, the development and helping people and stuff like that. And I said, okay, well, uh, let me think about that. And I kind of put two and two together and I realized there's, there's something deeper here. You see, Tony, as I've consulted with my, with my uh, firms, especially architects, engineers, the insurance carriers have focused on, on deep factors that affect risk, deep things that lead to claims. And architects and engineers have a high frequency and a high severity of claims. When they have, they happen often and they can be really expensive. And so we will often talk to them about these factors. But what I realized, what came together for me was that there are deeper things that affect how people engage these risk factors, which affect their performance. There's these deeper elements and it has to do with the people, people side of things. And so I would call, you know, your traditional risks, maybe hard risks, if you'll bear with me for a minute here. And, and, and leadership of businesses focus on these risks. There, there are more financial risks or bodily injury or property damage. And we sell insurance products and provide insurance products to help transfer the costs of these risks. So brokers focus on these risks. They're largely insurable. There's usually a very short-term impact and they're very um, attentive to these risks and they affect the delivery of goods and services for businesses. So there's a lot of focus on this, but soft risks are less tangible. They involve complex human factors such as behavior, turnover, morale, engagement, brand, culture, uh, leadership, communication, all these things affect how businesses function and how they engage these hard risks. So what I'm really putting out there is that if businesses will pay attention to these softer risks, a lot of them are managed by HR, a lot of them by the C-suite, really need to be coordinated by both, then it can flow up and help to prevent these hard risks which affect the business's performance and the lives of the people who work there. And it becomes this giant win-win situation. As I've worked with my firms and have helped them to try to instigate these traditional risk management strategies, I've realized that we leave it to these people to try to figure out how to do this and without really having an answer to go deeper. And soft risk management is that answer. It's the way to go deeper. It's the way to help manage some of these risks that are plaguing businesses and are so expensive. When I say plaguing, let me throw a couple of data points at you. Gallup produced um, a, a piece where they talked about the cost of turnover to U.S. businesses, and they said it's a $1 trillion problem for U.S. businesses. And then I read that it's an $8 trillion problem worldwide. That's the cost of turnover. Um, then you have Fortune Magazine that wrote this really interesting piece about a company that replaced all of their managers with coaches, and the productivity of the company grew by 20%. Now, I'm not saying that's what we need to do, but that just kind of illustrates the point um, when it comes to culture, Gallup said that two in 10 people feel connected to their company's culture and only 23% agree that they can apply their company's values. So there's this big gap between where people are at and what companies need to do to succeed. And soft risk management is that bridge to span that gap and help businesses to thrive and perform. You, you're, you're touching into a lot of the things that I'm really passionate about. And this is so interesting. I've never been a broker or a risk manager, uh, and, and so it's fascinating to me to see a broker come kind of full circle and end up with HR and talent issues, uh, right? So, so, so uh, my uh, passion that led to the creation of Insurance Nerds and then to this podcast was uh, how to help this industry uh, retain its young talent and, and how, to, how to help millennial and Gen Z talent grow within insurance and how to help the industry retain that talent and a lot of it comes down to culture, engagement, communication, uh, making sure that we're living up to the values that, that, that we say we're, 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 we represent. Uh, and, and those are things that, that a lot of, 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 the, of, of the traditional leadership uh, at both insurance and non-insurance companies uh, seem to, to think of as fluff.
think of seem to think right. Uh, my, my dad and his generation, uh, right, he's, he's a very classic boomer. In his case, from Costa Rica, not from not from the U.S., but a very classic baby boomer uh, in 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 his perspective of of like he's he's seen my session on millennials, and 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 his response is well, I'm I'm glad that that people are benefiting from your from your session and, and it's helping you make a name for yourself. But the very question of, of of how do we engage people at work is a foreign question to him, right? In his mind, I'm paying you. What like, like, like for his generation, for a lot of his generation, that was enough. As long as you were being paid properly, uh, whether you enjoyed the job, whether you felt that the job was doing something good for the world, wh wh whether you uh, w were what we now call engaged was a completely foreign question. L like, are, are we still paying your paycheck? Yes, then things are fine, right? And, and, and there's this perception uh, of everything can be f solved either with bonus pay or, or, or extra pay for doing the right thing uh, or with punishment for doing the wrong thing. And unfortunately, that's not the way humans work, right? We we are not oh. economicons. We we like the, the the this idea from economics of of uh, uh, what what is the word uh, of the completely rational Homo economicus, the completely rational person that that makes every decision based on on a perfect rational uh, analysis of the situation with perfect data doesn't exist we never have perfect data and we are not rational creatures and and now so so i get it 30 40 50 years ago we just didn't have that 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 psychology had not advanced to the point of of understanding these things uh but now we do behavioral psychology has come a long way uh and organizational psychology has come a long way and yet in the reality of practical doing business in the u.s it seems that that we ignore a lot of those teachings and continue to manage like it was a factory, except the white collar workers. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I, like, and, and I am not at all familiar with with, with the arti uh, architects and engineering and engineer space. Uh, but yeah, if I had to guess, happy engineers make less mistakes, <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. Happy yeah. architects uh, probably engage more in keeping themselves up to, up to date with the latest practices, and 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 also I, I do know from from insurance fraud training that. Uh, happy employees are less likely to steal from you. Yes. Right? So, so yeah. like, like engagement matters in white collar occupations, especially. Oh, for sure it does. And it's interesting you talk about generations. As part of my research, I found a study done by Harvard and, Stan Harvard and Stanford back in 1918. And they were reviewing the curriculum in engineering schools at the time. And they were trying to figure out what is it that makes an engineer successful in their career. Now, insurers care very much about having proficient engineers because if they're proficient and good, they're not gonna make mistakes and then they're not making professional liability claims. So they care about this deeply. Well, the fascinating thing about this study is they found that 15% of their success is determined by technical skills and 85% was determined by non-technical or soft skills their ultimate career success. That was over a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago. And I found a, a recent survey that found that, you know, there, we really haven't come that far that when it comes to training and corporate investment in training, 70% of the dollars are spent on technical skills, which are important. I'm not trying to downplay that one bit, but 30% are on some of these softer skills that really make the difference. It almost seems like, that should be weighted a little more heavily if that's what it takes to be successful. And it flows into all of these things that we're talking about, about engagement and culture and environment, performance, behavior. And it flows up into how people do their jobs, how they show up, how engaged they are, how they feel about their jobs, which affects performance and risk. And so um, this is a concept that's been around for a long time, but for whatever reason hasn't, like you just, so, I, so you stated much better than I did, just hasn't really been addressed or been a focus yet. And, and that's something I'm trying to point a light on is, hey, let's focus on this a little bit more. Let's help people to perform better as individuals and then also 
help them as they engage their organizations so that the businesses can go further and do more and be more successful. Have you found that, that the engineering and, and architecture worlds are starting to listen to you or only your clients? So it's a very interesting question. So I've been talking to some of my clients about this and every time I do my, my presentation, they just love it. They eat it up. Um, I've had the opportunity to present it on a larger scale a couple of times. Let me give you an example. There's a local association for credit managers. Credit managers, these are people who deal with helping to prevent credit problems for businesses. And I got invited to present to them. And um, they score the presenters on a scale of one to five. I got a 4.6, which I was told was unheard of. And they very much appreciated it. I had a chance to do it for some of my insurance carriers who caught wind of this. Some of my architect and engineer insurance carriers caught wind of this. And they said, this is really needed out there. We really need to get this out there. And they've invited me to present it on national levels. So people are interested in this topic. They can see that there's something deeper here. We've got to get to the human beings and help build them up. But the cool part about it, Tony, is it becomes this huge win-win. It's a huge win-win because it helps people and it helps businesses. And then when there's another win, it helps insurers and it reduces risk. So it's just this triple win that I think can make a big impact in the, in, in the industry. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. How, how do we, how do we get a bigger bullhorn? How do, how do we get a bigger loudspeaker in front of you uh, and, and get you in, in, into, I'm, I'm, I'm not a member of PLUS. I, I have never worked in professional liability. Have not, it's one of the few organizations in insurance that I have never been to their conference. If anybody from PLUS is listening, I would love to attend a couple of PLUS events. Uh, I'd be happy. You, you can get a double whammy. I will speak about millennials and, and Jeff will speak about, uh, uh, about soft risk management. Deal. Uh, Done. <laughs> I'll make a lot of noise for you on social media to get some extra people to, to, to go to the conference. Reach out. Uh, so so how, how, do, how do we get a, big, a bigger megaphone in front of, of these very important ideas? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here and giving me the chance to talk about this and get this message out there. Um, I, I, I really want to put it out there as much as I can and, and, and connecting with people like you and others is really important. So if there are any who are listening who want to learn more, um, you, can, you can look me up. Um, I have a website. Um, I, I set up an organization that I use to, to provide these services. It's called Hearst Coaching. So hearstcoaching.com, look me up. I'd love to speak or present um, to this topic. Um, and if anybody wants to get involved with some individual training, softriskmanagement.com um, will take you to a place where you can learn more about that. But I'd love, to, I'd love to, to get this message out there and see if I can help people to be better professionals and, and more empowered people in their lives so they can have better results. So any, any opportunity to put that out there, I'd love to have that opportunity. Awesome. T tell me about, about, more about, about the coaching side. Yeah, so, you know, this topic, when I first gave one of the earlier presentations I did for one of my clients, um, they sat me down afterwards and they said, Jeff, this is a great topic. We really liked it and it's awesome, but this is not a once and done topic. You can't just give a 60-minute presentation and they've got it nailed. It requires, if you're working with people, and people changing how they approach themselves in life, that requires some follow-up. It requires some additional um, training and insight. And they said, what are you gonna do about it, Jeff? <laughs> and I said, well, uh, I'm trained in this area. I, I know what to do. I just haven't organized something. So I, I put together a 12-week group coaching program. And I put together my first cohort, had 30 people jump on. And um, they had a great experience and we had weekly trainings that are about 40 minutes long and some action steps and accountability and follow up. I got great feedback from those who participated who called it motivated and powerful and found it to be very helpful for them in their profession. So that was just kind of the beginning and we're trying to figure out right now how to get this message out there further because it does require a bit more. But our goal is to help people, Tony. We want to help people because uh, you know, there's a lot of hard things out there. We live in different times, different generations, like you said, and these are tools that can make a difference in people's lives and in their, in their businesses. When, when was the 12 week? 
So I started it last August and it ran through November. Um, I, did a, I did a second cohort in the, in the winter um, and uh, we're just trying to get the word out to see if we can figure out how best to do this and how best to put it out there, whether it be on a recorded basis or live cohort basis and perhaps even an individual group basis. Um, I'll say this, I, I have a, a marketing consultant I've been working with, um, this amazing woman in Utah her named Charlene Ignacio. So there's my shout out to Char. And um, she, um, she's saying, you know, Jeff, you really need to get in front of HR people. You really need to get in front of HR people because they kind of guide this process and organization. So that's another avenue. This is kind of a new thing, so I'm not sure how best to put it out there. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to talk to you and others and just see how we can help. So, so HR is not my world. I, I, I'm very interested in a lot of HR and talent issues, but I've never worked in yeah. HR. But Me my too. understanding is uh, SHRM. Yeah, is, is where it's at. So, so connecting with with SHRM, uh, whether locally in Utah or on a national level, would open up some doors to to. Uh, like, I wonder, for example, can you get your program certified for for SHRM hours, for because they they have CE credits on their designations. Uh, and and they do, they they do allow third party providers to become to be to become certified for 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 uh, SHRM hours. So so I, I'm glad that you are working with with the marketing consultant to 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 get the word out because yeah this is really really kind of a, kind of a cool thing uh, and and absolutely so important. It blows my mind that I remember that I've, I've been in the, in the insurance industry for. Uh, I don't know, 13, 14 years, something, something like that, and 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 uh, 13, uh, yeah, 13, 14, uh, and and as a giant nerd, I remember early on, and, I, and again, my focus is very much on the people that work in the industry, while you're helping another industry through the focus of risk management. Uh, but I, I remember reading some some books on 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 uh, on, organiza on organizational psychology, and especially on on behavioral psychology. And going like, oh, we're doing this way wrong. I'm sure they're working on it. And yeah. 13 years later, <laughs> crickets. Yeah, nothing's changed. I mean, the, not nothing, but but yeah, yeah. The changes are, are are not coming from where I expected them to come. I thought the changes would come from the leadership, and I thought the changes would come from HR. And it turns out the changes are coming from people like you and me. Uh, creating awareness for great ideas, building followerships for great ideas, uh, and encouraging uh, people to to demand those things at, at their companies. And uh, I go back to a generational thing, which is the lens through which I, I, I see a lot of things in, in, in talent. Uh, millennials and Gen Zers are more than happy to, to vote with their feet and go to the places where they believe in the culture. I, just in the last few days, uh, Chat with Tony Conversations, which is my free career advice uh, service for insurance professionals, chatwithtony.com. Uh, just in the last few days, I've had three or four people either uh, not take a job b because they were not convinced that, that the new company uh, had the right culture and they were and, and, and their current company does a little better culture fit, uh, and and I, I go back to my, my dad and his generation. That, like the idea of not taking a promotion, not not taking a twenty or twenty five percent raise, uh, because you agree less with the other company's values uh, than your current company is absolutely insane in his mind. Oh, yeah, or, blows their mind. yeah. Or, or literally the other side of that same coin, of I'm willing to take a pay cut to work for 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 a company with with a with values I believe in. Uh, I have a podcast episode I recorded just yesterday, has or just earlier today, hasn't gone live. Uh, this woman has an incredibly blue chip background, uh, Yale degrees and, and stuff, two masters from Yale, and, and uh, she's now running an insure tech. And, and basically, this insure tech is an offshoot of a legal of a law firm. And uh, she was at the law firm do, doing some some project work for them, waiting for for her her second grad degree to start. And they asked her to to postpone for a year to to help them with a project, and basically, she, she, like like, she loved their values so much uh, 
uh, before getting the job that, that she like stalked them until she got the job. And wow. then she was willing to postpone her, her second graduate degree for, for, for a year uh, in order to, to, to run this project for them because she believed that much in the organization. That kind of commitment you can't buy, right? That only comes from people that truly believe in your mission and, and truly feel at home in, your, in, in the organization that, 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 that you've built. And, and if you're not reading your Glassdoor reviews, if you're not doing exit interviews, if you're not uh, finding ways to feel the pulse of your people, and by the way, Gallup surveys are not enough because at, at many companies, uh, the, the Gallup survey uh, kind of has the following effect. Uh, the new people participate and honestly tell you what they think, uh, and, and they are punished by meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting uh, over the results, and no change happens. So within yeah. a couple of years, they learn that being honest in the Gallup survey, maybe it doesn't get you punished, but it creates endless meetings that don't solve anything because your manager's not empowered to solve the things that you're complaining about. Uh, so so uh, you have to find a way to have a, a true pulse of, of what's going on in, in, in your organization. Uh, and and uh, I'll plug Insure Equality here. I'm on the board of, of Insure Equality. Uh, they have a tool called Phoenix, where, or we have a tool, I guess, since I'm on the board, uh, where any insurance professional can rate what their company feels like when it comes to different diversity and inclusion issues. Um, and eventually we'll, we'll have enough data to go to, to the carriers and the brokers and say, hey, here's what you're saying about diversity and inclusion. Here, here's what your people are saying. And, and I'm not saying this is the ultimate solution. And, and it's, you know, I've taken this in a weird direction into the DEI space, but companies should be doing the same when it comes to their culture overall, not just the AI stuff. Like, like how do you get the measure of, of, of the real culture on the floor uh, and what people are really perceiving? And, and eventually those things lead to real profits or, and losses and insurable losses or non-insurable losses. It's so true. It's so true. Well, and, and for anyone listening, um, I have an introductory workshop called Introduction to Soft Risk, the deep power to dramatically change culture, inclusion, organizations, and lives. And, um, you know, culture is really the sum of each individual's behavior. That's what it is. It's not this statement written up by C-suite, put on a wall by HR with some crackers and birthday cake in the, in the break room. You know, it's more than that. It's how people approach themselves and each other. And that's really what we're trying to get at. And, and the difference we're trying, trying to make for people is to help them to grow and improve. And, it, and when it comes to managing risk, you mentioned you know, that I've, you know, I've kind of been testing it out with the people that I know and the architects, engineers, but I'm finding that it has a very broad application to in any professional who wants to improve how they function in their profession and how they perform individually. And that does include insurance carriers. They're risk managers too, at the end of the day. They're trying to manage the risk of the insurer's capital. And so any, any organization that feels that like they could benefit from this, I'd, I'd be happy to do this, this, give them this free intro workshop or, or send a recording of it to them, um, record it and send it to them. I haven't recorded it yet, but I'd be happy to, to help people understand what this is all about and maybe how it can apply to them and just see if it's something they want to look at further. I, I was going to say, I would love to watch a recording of it and, and I highly encourage you to, to get a good quality recording of it and make it available. Uh, even, even if it's for a, for a small charge, uh, I, I, I think that, that it's such an important topic that, that my, uh, the, the way to maximize the, the reach uh, is, is, is by making it, at least this particular session, which is an intro, available for, for the rest of, uh, for, for, for the overall you know, workforce. Uh, Fantastic. Well, I'll take you up on that. And Tony, you'll be the first one to get a copy of it once yeah. I have it recorded. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're kind of out of time today, but a but, uh, super interesting topic. Keep me posted on how I can help expand, uh, you know, uh, augment the message, which is what I'm really good at. Uh, my reach is none with, within, within our, uh, the, the, the architects and engineering world, but within insurance, I have significant reach. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for, for, for joining me today. 
Well, thank you. It's been great to be here with you, Tony, and thanks for this opportunity. Awesome.